Hello! <laughs> okay, I'm in our composting toilet. Uh, we have woofers on our farm and also sometimes you're in the garden and you just got a pinch of loaf and you don't you can't make it to the house. So it's good to have this option available to you. So composting toilets are really simple. They're kind of like an outhouse, except that there's no hole in the bottom. And so we've got a, a bin down here and a regular toilet seat. And so basically what you're trying to do with uh, composting human waste or human manure is you're trying to balance the nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium that exists in human waste with carbon. Now, most of you have probably been in one of those um, nasty government outhouses in a national park uh, that you can, like, you can't breathe in them. They're just absolutely hideous. And the reason that they're hideous is that uh, you have too much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in one place, and then it's not balanced with carbon. Um, Mollison said that any system oversupplied with energy goes into chaos and those systems are in absolute chaos. And so um, if you have an outhouse, you can turn your outhouse into a composting toilet, literally just by adding sawdust to the, uh, to the mix. And so sawdust, depending on the type of tree that you're using, has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 300 to one. If you're using hardwoods like oak, uh, it can be as high as 500 to one versus kind of human waste is probably going to be, you know, two to one, three to one, five to one. So really high in nitrogen, really low in carbon. And so if you've ever tried composting just vegetable scraps, and if you don't get enough carbon in there, you'll also notice that it stinks as well. And so literally in a, in a composting toilet, we do our business um, and we're done. We just grab some carbon and dump it into the bucket. And ideally, We'll put enough carbon in there so that our grogans and whatever other magical things come out the other end uh, get covered. And so the next person that's going to use it, all they see is sawdust. Um, they don't have to see anything else. What's really cool about the sawdust that we use is that we have a lot of trees on our property. And so we actually mill our own logs. Um, and the process of milling leaves us with some sawdust. And so we're able to use the sawdust. We're able to use all the scraps off the tree in our wood stove, and we're able to use the wood that we mill as well in our construction projects. And so everything gets cycled. Now, once this bucket is filled, then we go to the humanure pile, which is where we're gonna to go to next. These are a couple of um, composting bins that we inherited with the property, and we're gonna rebuild them and we're gonna locate them in another location once we have time. But in the meantime, they've actually served the function of uh, getting us started with composting and with humanure. And so for us, we don't actually differentiate our humanure compost and our vegetable scraps. We put it all together. Um, the trick with composting is you want to get a high enough temperature for a long enough time. And if you don't get the high enough temperature, you still need to get the long enough time. Either of those two things will get you to a, a sterile compost, essentially. And so uh, to say it a different way, if you have a really hot temperature, you can get there quicker. If you have a lower temperature, it might just take a little bit longer to get there. And if you uh, are able to get both time and temperature together, you, you're guaranteed to get a really safe product off the back end. So one of the most important components to a human or compost is a really good uh, composting thermometer. So this is a product from Rio Temp. I'll leave a link to it in the show notes below. This is a fast acting thermophilic composting probe. It's in Celsius. I think it also has Fahrenheit as well. And you want to try and mix your compost with the right carbon to nitrogen ratio such that you're getting to 55 degrees Celsius for an extended period of time. And so we measure how effective our recipe is by sticking that probe into the compost. And this compost is pretty much uh, complete now. We'll see if and this one should be as well because oh, we're getting a bit of temperature in there. And so this is kind of our, our speedometer for the, the compost pile. Now in a perfect world, you're gonna have two or three of these bins, depending upon how many people you're providing a composting uh, toilet service to. So a family of four needs about two cubic meters or two of these bins essentially to get through a year. So, so you'll probably fill up both of these and then you'll wanna have two more for the next year because you want these to sit in place for about one year before you apply them to anything. 
And then generally speaking, we apply all of this compost to perennial systems. So we would put them in our fruit orchards, in our berry systems, anywhere that it's not gonna touch um, garden crops. You can still put it in your garden and actually I wouldn't really have any concerns about that. But if, you're, if you are concerned about any kind of cross contamination of pathogens or things like that, just placing it on plants and systems that are perennial uh, as opposed to like, things like potatoes. Like so right behind me I've got, or right in front of me I guess, right behind you, we've got a raspberry patch. And so this is gonna be uh, one of our perennial systems. And so I would have no qualms putting the compost from there straight onto our raspberry patch right here because all of the food that we're consuming is above the ground. Um, and so there's no chance really of cross-contamination. In one of my past videos, I talked about the problems of industrial agriculture. As I mentioned in that video, there are several problems, several big problems with industrial agriculture, one of which is we're running out of nutrients. And I also mentioned that um, it's really difficult to imagine a world moving to an entirely vegetarian or vegan diet because when you buy a carrot off of an industrial farm, organic or not, doesn't really matter, they're both industrial, that carrot then travels um, across the country and you eat it and then you defecate it and you put it into drinking water, which then goes off to a sewage treatment plant. The nutrients in that carrot never actually return to the soil in which it was grown. And so there's an open loop system there. Now, one of the benefits of a composting toilet is that when you consume food, you eat it, you defecate into the composting toilet, you compost it, and then that nutrient gets to return back into the system with which it came from. And that's one of the main advantages of a composting toilet system. And so those are the, the basics of composting toilets. We go into those in a lot more detail in our permaculture design course. We spend an entire section just talking about how to set them up. I can highly recommend a book by, his name is John Jevons, The Humanure Handbook. It's a fantastic book if you're interested in learning more about how to build your own humanure system. And I'll leave a link to that book down below. And if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section. We'll take a look at those a little bit later. Thanks so much, guys.